Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Conversations on Critical Operations. And today we're going to be talking to Nora Thompson. She is a Senior Information Officer at Power & Water Corporation in Darwin, Australia. Good morning, Nora. Hi. Good morning. And we're going to be talking to uh, Kieran Megan, who's a Senior SCADA and Control System Engineer at Power & Water. Uh, good morning, Kieran. Hi, Nick. And I'm Nick Durazio. Uh, if you have any questions as we go through, please ask them in the YouTube chat. Let's get right into it. I guess uh, if we can start, Nora, can you just describe the company a little bit, please? So Power and Water Corporation, um, we're a government owned corporation here in the Northern Territory of Australia. Um, we provide water um, services uh, to geez, how many customers? 51,000 customers across the Territory. We also have wastewater um, services, uh, electricity customers, and we also provide gas. So we're a full service utility right across the Territory. The Territory, I think in our presentation we've got is the equivalent of the population of Wyoming in an area twice the size of Texas. We are a large state, but we do not have very many people in it. Um, okay. And we have major centres, minor centres and remote communities. Kieran is more familiar with our remote communities. We have 72 of those. They are small. Um, we have five major urban centres and 14 minor centres. Okay. What is your need for real-time data? Well, in the beginning it was just to see our real-time data. So we use um, SCADA systems to control our water and sewer networks. In the beginning, when we first put Pi in, in 2008, we did what a lot of people did and we just stored data from that SCADA system. We were looking at flow rates, tank levels, um, sewerage flows, outflow rates, uh, stuff like that. And we just stored it. We didn't do very much with it. Um, we were using it to do a little bit of monthly reporting, but not a lot. And after a few years, we realized that we could actually use a lot more of this, not just for the reporting we were doing, but actually to get some information about how we're operating those assets. And so a lot of what we've done um, in the last few years in particular is to gain intelligence about how we're operating our assets. Okay, okay. And uh, because of the uh, forest flung nature of all your different facilities, it's not been particularly easy to get reliable information. Uh, can you describe some of the problems you were having with that? Actually, Kieran's probably a better person to ask about some of those. He's got a couple of really good examples. Great. Yeah, so um, we monitor, as Nora said, about 72 remote communities. So they're anywhere from sort of 700 kilometers away in some cases. So it, it can take, you know, uh, a good day's drive to get there. Um, I think our furthest community that I can remember is about uh, just over a thousand kilometers from Darwin. So, um, you know, monitoring those sort of sites is, is quite important. Um, so we monitor everything from, as Nora said, the, the generators, the, the bores um, through to tank levels. But we also use the Pi system to monitor a lot of our network hardware. So. Um, our routers, our switches, all of that sort of thing. So, okay. And yeah, go, go, please go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say, so um, a lot of what we, we are using the Pi system for, at least from the remote side, is yeah, it's, it's monitoring our, our data in, in our assets, but um, monitoring how things work and whether they're working is, is a, a hugely important task. I mean, I think in the remote space, we've got somewhere around 3,000 points dedicated solely for monitoring interfaces and, and the hardware that it's running on. Um, so okay. we, we do a lot of that side of thing. Yeah, and speaking of those interfaces, you have a lot of data. Historically, you've had a lot of data, and it hasn't always been easy to get all that data given the network speeds, right? Yeah, correct. So um, when we first uh, started rolling out what we call our SCADA wide area network or SCADA WAN in um, remote areas, uh, we were using a satellite system which had uh, a bandwidth of about 128 kilobits per second. So if people think of the good old days of dial-up internet, um, basically double that, but shared across every single site. So if you've got one site that's using heaps of bandwidth, all the rest get nothing. Um, so when we first started, this was over six locations, so we had six PI interfaces. 
Um, so as time moved on, we've now moved up. We've got uh, about 2.1 megabits per second of, of data throughput, but that's now shared over 94 Pi interfaces in 61 locations. So being able to minimize that uh, bandwidth is, is critically important. I mean, this, this system is used not just for sending our data through, but also for our operators to log into the remote SCADA systems and change set points or see what's going on. Um, it's also used for our network monitoring, um, doing our Windows updates and all of that sort of stuff. So trying to reduce that bandwidth is, is, is massive. Okay, and if and if I understand correctly, there's problems with the weather as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Weather is a massive thing in in the Northern Territory. I mean, unfortunately, um, our satellite hub is actually in Darwin. So during the wet season, during between about two o'clock and about three o'clock in the afternoon, it'll go down multiple times due to rain. Um, so yeah, weather weather's a massive one. Um, lightning strikes is another one. You know, we have comms equipment taken out all the time. I think I've found a, a news article from. 2018 or 19, there was 91,000 lightning strikes in the Darwin region in one day. Um, so, you know, being able to cater for those comms outages, even if they're only for a couple of minutes or if they're for a couple of days, if we've had a, a satellite system get hit, um, yeah, it, it, they're huge challenges for us. Yeah, I've got on the screen now the, um, I guess that, that graphic that shows the uh, precipitation along with, what are those? Are those network outages? Yeah, so on the left, that's um, a map of the Darwin region taken, I think it was about uh, February or March or something this year. Um, and over on the right hand side is um, a screen that I've done up in Pi Vision to monitor all of our interfaces. So each of those red dots is an interface that's fallen over. So out of our 94 interfaces or something, I think we'd lost all but about six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so given all of the challenges and the need that Nora described for you know for data. Uh, what was your solution for that? And can you describe it in terms of? I mean, you, you did different things over the years, right? Uh, yeah. So look, I mean, when we first started, um, you know, we, we were trying to use things like dial-up modems, um, and 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 they that just didn't work. You know, you're talking about a community 700 kilometers away on a modem that's you know might be working at you know half of what it should be. Uh, we've tried doing reports out of SCADA and letting all the data sort of buffer in the remote site, but that just gets quite frustrating because with, you know, 61 individual SCADA systems, it just takes hours. We used to schedule up a report every Monday night and you come in on Tuesday morning and you maybe, if you're lucky, would have a quarter of them because the rest, oh, the modem fell over. Oh, this one, the data wasn't there. So it was... A, it was uh, the, met the metric I, th I thought was fascinating. <laughs> from your presentation was ICU, which some of our viewers may be familiar with, the interface configuration utility would take 15 minutes to launch. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> pretty common. Um, I, I've, I've gotten to the point now where if I need to go and configure an interface, you sort of go open up the ICU and then come back 10 or 15 minutes later after having a chat with someone <laughs> and having a coffee. Uh, that, that's pretty normal. <laughs> Okay, okay. So huge challenges. And uh, have I left anything out? Because I'd like to get into what your solution was, if not. Um, I, I think part of the rest of it, you know, when you're talking about data and our usage originally, I mean, we, we've had a lot of um, manually faxed in data. I mean, Power and Water still uses a fair amount of faxes. Um, but that has lessened off quite considerably. I mean, we, we generally, we've got an ESO faxing in a read sheet every week, um, and then someone manually entering that into into uh, an Excel spreadsheet somewhere, which then goes into our document management system, and then someone manually goes through and pulls out you know, the data out of it, does a bit of calculation. So there's a lot of manual processes, um, and, and a few of them are still going, but a lot of that is reduced quite considerably just, just due to Pi. Yeah, we okay. still use um, daily phone calls to touch base with our remote service operators um, just to make sure that things are operating okay. That still happens on a regular basis right through the year, each day, each workday. Um, a lot of our systems we set up mainly for operational purposes, not for reporting or for gathering data for any other purpose, but to operate our assets. And so we're trying to pivot from that, and Pi has been pivotal, pivotal. I can't say that word today. <laughs> been really important for us to move from there to um, knowing more about our assets. 
Yeah, one okay. of the things with our system, I guess, is that it's been in place since about the early 90s, and, and it was never designed for data transfer. It was basically, hey, we put a SCADA system out somewhere, and now we can connect to it. Great, now what? Okay. Now, then, talking about the SCADA, um, you, you said with the network, um, even now, I guess, access to the SCADA system itself is fairly slow, but people are duplicating some of the displays in PyVision, is that correct? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's one of the things that happens quite regularly. I mean, we get a lot of requests. Hey, I, I, I really like that SCADA screen, but I can't get access to it because I'm, you know, not in the office or I don't have the on-call laptop or whatever. Can I can I see that on Pi? It's like, yeah, cool. Yeah, we, we've got all the data. We'll go and recreate it for you. So yeah, it, it's pretty regular for people to go through and do pretty much complete duplications of the main SCADA screens on each site. Um, and and. Pi just gives them that ability, you know, using Pi Vision, we've got um, access uh, remotely from people's mobile phones or from their laptops or whatever to view Pi Vision. So, yeah, people will sit at home on the weekend, go through and think, oh, I wonder what's happening at whichever community it is. Oh, I'll just log in and have a look. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So, um, and what did you do over the years? Did you have any homegrown solutions before? I mean, you did arrive at a solution that improved things since since early on that involved configuration of tags. Did you, did you do any, uh, I mean, can you describe that? I, and what I'm, what I'm getting at is you, you, were, you had at one point, if I remember the metrics right, 94 interfaces. Each interface, was it a thousand tags? No, I'm getting it wrong. But thousands of tags for yeah. each interface and then each, each tag scan once per second. Yes. And, so, and, and your network just wasn't cutting that, right? Yeah, correct. Um, when, when we sort of started with this stuff, and, and a lot of it has kind of grown up, um, so we never were at the point where we had sort of, you know, 100,000 tags all being scanned at one second. But without the Pi system, that's definitely where we would have been. Um, so the Pi system that we've got, we're looking at somewhere around, for the remote sides, about 56,000 tags. Um, for the urban centres, we're looking at maybe about the same. So we're sitting at sort of 110, 120,000 tags in total. Um, the majority of those, especially on the generation side of, of the business, are scanned, yeah, once a second. Um, when you're looking at something like a frequency on a generator or, or on a frequency going out to a community, being out by two and a half hertz out of 50 hertz is, is quite significant. So we're scanning it that quickly. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, a lot of... Excuse me for just a second. I'm sorry. I thought I muted my phone, but apparently it is still connected to my Mac that I'm using to facilitate this live stream. I'm sorry, everybody. Perhaps we'll cut that out in the final, but I'm sorry. What were you saying? That's all right. Yeah, so um, we've, we've got that sort of um, around 56,000 tags in remote and, yeah, the 100,000 tags in um, water that are yeah, being scanned at about once a second. So you're looking at you know 100,000 point updates every second. Um, and, and, and it's just not feasible. I mean, with that satellite network of only two megabits per second, it's just not gonna cut it. There's no way we can we can squeeze all that data in in that, that tiny little pipeline. Okay, so what, so what are you doing then? Um, I mean, is that still the situation? Is there still things that you can't get to that you would like to get to? So what I was getting at was uh, you did some clever stuff with the exception test to mitigate the problem. Yeah, so um, the Pi system's been really great for that side of things. You know, it, the exception and compression are, are great. And the one that really helps us out, especially with that comms path, is just exception. You know, the fact that we can go from having 100,000 tag updates to somewhere around 1,100. Um, so that's where we're currently sitting. It's, it sort of bounces around a bit, you know. But yeah, generally around 1,100 to 1,200 um, updates per second is, is quite normal. Um, so that's an absolutely massive reduction in bandwidth. So we're, we're looking at, uh, on the remote side of things, about 300 to 400 kilobits per second worth of Pi data, um, which is really not that much for the amount of stuff that we're, we're looking at. Uh, so yeah, exception's been absolutely you know, essential. We, we wouldn't be able to run the network without it. There's, there's just no way. Okay, you got any tips for people who are trying to set an exception? I tell you, when we when in our classes, that was the, the hottest topic we could ever get into. Is what would you set for exception and compression? Oh, uh, I hate that topic. I, I get <laughs> I, I get asked fairly regularly, actually. You know, when you're talking to people about the Pi system or about what we've done, they go, "Oh, so what do I do to set my exception and compression?" And I just go, "Oh, mate, 
Look, my best advice is um, have a look at the data sheet for whatever instrument you're looking at. Um, so if it's a flow meter, go back, you know, they'll all have a percentage on them of um, accuracy. So go and look at that. Um, that's that's your best starting point. Um, from there, okay. yeah, look, I mean, there, there's a, there's a, there is a tool in the archive to go through and look at the points that have the most number of samples coming through. That's a really good place to start as well. It's really good for saying, hey, that one's way oversampled. Um, but I tell you, it's it's easy to find the oversample. It's oh, not easy yeah. to find the undersample, right? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I, I've I, we, we've had a few cases of that. Um, I did accidentally configure a tag very very badly once, and um, it was uh, again a frequency tag that should have been sampling at about 0.01 hertz, which should have been its you know kind of exception rating. Uh, yeah, it was at 20 hertz. Um, so when you're talking about something with a normal value of 50 hertz, uh, 20 hertz is a fairly large uh, exception uh, limit to have in there. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, manager of generation was quite annoyed at me, shall we say. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I guess another question then is, well, you know what, we've been, we've been talking so much about your physical location, and I haven't shown anybody some of these... Uh, some of these amazing visuals that you shared with us. Uh, I mean, let me, I'm just showing some of the pictures right now. Uh, you want to explain the crocodile in the back of the truck? <laughs> so the crocodile in the back of the truck, that was taken at a community called Palumpa, I think it was, uh, which is about five or 600 uh, kilometers out of Darwin. So uh, from what I understand, uh, there was a, uh, a crocodile that was sort of terrorizing the town, shall we say, you know, the children weren't uh, safe to go down and have a swim in the river. Uh, so the police and, and the wildlife and all that uh, guys went out and actually shot it. Uh, and then they went, oh wow, we've got this five and a half meter long croc, what do we do with it? Uh, so they picked it up with a backhoe and put it in the back of the ESO's ute, which is our operator on the, on the ground to get rid of it. Okay. And uh, I think that actually made the front page of the Northern Territory News, and it was shared around the world, I think, because it's just, it's just insane. <laughs> oh, very nice, very nice. Okay. Okay, well, um, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask you about is buffering. Uh, one of the things that ended up, and, and again, I don't want to keep rah-rah about all the great features of what, you know, what OSIsoft does, but one of the issues you had was bad connectivity because of weather. And one of the solutions to that is a solution for real-time data, the buffers. Can you describe the issue and the solution that you ended up using? Yeah, so look, the main one was, um, it was as I mentioned, every sort of 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the wet season in Darwin, the satellite system would just go down for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, but we also do have cases where, you know, we're talking about a lot of remote equipment in, in very sort of isolated locations and things just happen, you know. we. Uh, we'll lose a satellite modem for a week at a time purely because we just cannot get anyone out there. Um, so in the wet season, it's quite normal for communities to be cut off for a couple of weeks, if not months at a time, just because road access is not available. The airstrip that they've got so, uh, a dirt strip, so they can't land planes there. So yeah, what we did was um, using the buffering is uh, we've installed that on every single interface. They're all set up to um, restore without a connection to the Pi system. So if we have a power outage while everything's offline, it all just boots back up again and keeps on going. And and that's that's saved us you know massively in a lot of cases. You know we have quite a lot of reporting requirements as a utility, especially on the water quality side of things. And, and being able to buffer all of that data when the connection comes back up and just send it all through, yeah, it, it's it's completely invaluable. Um, it, it's just, yeah. Um, we generally sort of run somewhere in the order of about two to three years worth of buffering on most com uh, most computers. Um, not because we need to, it's just because like, oh, well, why not? Okay. So now that you've got, I mean, you've got this fine-tuned so that you can get notifications, you can get uh, visualizations, through, uh, you know, on a web connection, what kind of results are you getting from that? What what are what are those things doing for you that you weren't be able to, uh, weren't able to do before? I think that's back to you, Nora. Well, we're getting more work, um, <laughs> which I suppose is a really good byproduct of that. Uh, look, the notifications actually has been brilliant. Um, so, uh, what they've done in the remote space is because those SCADA systems are local, um, when an alarm goes off, in order for the guys here in the urban centres to be aware of what's going on, if um, they're 
working for the remote side of the business. Um, Kieran and a group of other people have set up notifications to send text messages to whoever's on call. Now, this means that we have not real time, not right now, but near real time, um, alarms to what's happening in our SCADA system in a remote location. And I think this is fantastic. Um, it gives us so much more awareness of how we are operating those assets and how they're being operated and all those interesting little bits and pieces about um, the chlorine monitoring in particular, whether it's gone off, whether it's gone on, all of these things are things that we did not know except through a phone call in the past. As we roll out more and more infrastructure and use the Pi system more and more to do um, those notifications for chlorine, we're starting to get more of a feel about what's happening within the community. And this is all stuff that we didn't know before unless we were sitting there. And as Kieran has hinted, sitting in some of those communities, it's not just they're remote, it's you don't have a phone connection. When was the last time you sat somewhere and you didn't have any bars on your mobile phone? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, now um, there's also, I guess, a, a question for Kieran. Whenever you do notifications or any type of alarming, you're, you're faced with nuisances. How, what, what advice would you give to people? How have you been able to make those meaningful or, or have you been able to make them meaningful yet? Look, that's, that's the constant challenge. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, if your data coming in from your SCADA system is really nice, really well curated and, and quality um, assured and all of that stuff, then you, you don't have a problem. But, you know, I don't know of anyone who has that. Um, so, yeah, look, um, I guess the main thing that we've found is, is not to get too enthusiastic with notifications. I mean, I won't dump Nora in it too much, but uh, yeah, we, do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did have an occasion when uh, we'll say a certain senior data uh, person in Power and Water in Darwin uh, managed to configure a notification for the main water storage in Darwin. Uh, so when it overflows, this is a dam, uh, it sends a notification out. Unfortunately, someone had accidentally ticked the resend every five minutes button. So every five minutes, the senior management in water services got another notification. Um, so look, barring uh, us just stuffing up, um, yeah, look, not, not going too enthusiastic, I guess, with the timeouts. Um, we're talking about systems that are, you know, quite a long way away. And if you're putting a timeout in there of, say, you know, 10 seconds for something to be active, well, 10 seconds might be the amount of time it takes to sort of get through the system from one end to the other, just on the data side of things. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, okay. you know, we all stuff up. <laughs> I do it quite regularly. Okay. Right, right. And I wanted to show a couple of, uh, or share a couple of uh, um, slides uh, that show some of the Pi Vision displays that you've been able to build. Let me just see if we're looking at this. Can you describe some of these vision displays and what we're looking at? What we're looking at is that f there's four that you were going to be uh, presenting at the user conference. Let me go ahead and put it on the screen so everybody can see it in more detail. So I'm just kind of scrolling through these four displays. What, uh, what, what were people able to do with this that, you know, say they weren't able to, to do before? So I guess there's there's a few in there. Um, you would have seen the one earlier with all of the little red dots on it. Um, that that's one that I use quite regularly myself just to monitor our, our interfaces. Um, right, also, that's this that's this one right here. Yeah, for those yep, watching. Yep. So, right. um, but then the the other four. So we've got one with uh, a bunch of sort of reading red blobs on it, which is all of our generators and feeders on a remote community. So that one's used quite regularly by our. Uh, operations guys so they'll sit there on the weekend and pull that up and say okay well you know what's the generator doing is it running you know you've sort of got you know uh, uh, and and please don't go on about red and green which is running and stopped it's a very large topic at power and water but you know all of our yes. feeders down the bottom are all red meaning they're running you know we've got power going out to the community we've got our little solar system there saying yep i've got this much you know power going through it so the guys use it all the time to say how's my community going when they don't have access to the SCADA um there's a okay uh, so th so that's an example of one of those things that we, is there an equivalent scada display uh it's like not this quite the same but very similar um so okay. the, the sort of left hand side of that with the pictures of all the generators and feeders that is exactly the same as the scada system so if you if you okay. pulled up our scada it would look like that the graphs on the right hand side not so much they're they're separated off but yeah, definitely. yeah and 
And the beauty of this is it's read only. So since it's since it is read only, then it's well, it's something that everybody can look at uh, nearly instantaneously. And it's not it's not something that the, the contrast you described uh, is that is that the SCADA system taxes it remotely. It's it just takes a long time. This doesn't take a long time, correct? People can yeah. bring this up fairly quickly in the field? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, to access it through their mobile phone, I mean, we've got all the usual security requirements of two-factor authentication and that sort of fun stuff. But, you know, you're talking okay. about, you know, a minute or two to access it. If you've got the SCADA system, I mean, you've got to go in through the VPN, you've then got to sign in, you've got to open up a connection on a really slow satellite system, wait for it to load, you know, so it just takes a long time. Um, and and the main thing really is is all the security requirements. I mean, the SCADA system, you've got access to go in and turn off a power station if you really wanted to, you know. So being able to do it through Pi Vision, I mean, I, I can hand that page to anyone in the, in the corporation and sure, they can have a look at it, but they can't do anything with it, which, which just means it's so much more secure. Right, right. And that's, boy, I, I, keep, I keep forgetting to mention that is that's obviously one of the reasons that um, you know, real-time data in a read-only form like this is absolutely. I mean, it's it's crucial to have something like this around. If I can, if okay. I can uh, toot our own horn. So uh, I'm looking at Acacia Larechia chlorination system. Uh, pretty, can you describe that? That was pretty good, actually. Um, I should have used a really horrible name in there, like <laughs> a bladder watch or something. <laughs> so um, that's one more for a uh, fault finding tool. So this one's used um, by our operators to say what the chlorination system's doing. So there's two chlorine pumps in there plus the main system. So that's showing all the faults, the pressures in the pumps, uh, what flow rates they're flowing at, what the warnings or, or faults are, all of that sort of stuff. So it's more of a, a fault finding tool which they won't look at day to day, but they'll go in and have a look at it when they need to. Uh, so that's fairly recent, actually. That one's probably only been created in probably January or February this year, I think. Okay, great. Well, I won't go through all of them because, hey, you're still gonna. Hopefully, you'll still be able to present in Bar Barcelona uh, <laughs> if we do that. So, um, anyway, but um, okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Fingers crossed. Okay. Um, was there any kind of a you know surprise benefit? I, and Pat Kennedy, our founder and CEO, he loves describing how people buy a, a system to do real time data, and then that's just the start. It's like the things that you can figure out, you can do with it that you didn't think going in sometimes can be incredible. Did you get any kind of results like that? Boy, I hope you I hope you did. That was an awful big build up for something that may <laughs> no, not no. have a payoff. <laughs> but did you get any surprise benefits? We've had a few people that had buy-in fairly late in the game. So in the last six months in particular, um, a lot of people from our assets group um, here in urban and also um, who work in the remote space have all of a sudden gone, okay, this actually is really cool. I can use this to do some really interesting stuff. We've um, just finished a project looking at uh, water balances in some of the smaller communities and, and how we can use Pi we're looking at how we can use Pi to replicate this information because at the moment it's sitting in a database, which is great, but it's just sitting in that solitary database that two people know how to access. We need to share that information. And so a lot of the benefits that we've got right now is how much information we can now share with each other. So between the different work groups in water services, there's a lot more sharing of information which I think has been great. And you walk into the lunchroom and people are talking about Pi and some of the new things they've found in Pi um, or found using Pi. Um, so they're getting a lot more ownership of their data. And that's really, really cool as far as I'm concerned anyway. I think we've heard, we've, yeah, go ahead. So I, say, I think my two favorite little things that I've found with Pi, and one of them is is kind of, I guess it's what it's used for, but not really, is it's not just storing operational data, but using it as just a centralized spot to pull things from you know we, we've ended up in power and water through years and years of you know people working on stuff with multiple databases you know we've got one for smart water metering we've got one for water quality we've got one for a hydrogeology department you know on and on and on and on and on um, and one of the things that sort of started happening in the last few years are people are going oh look i really need to compare this groundwater data with this flow rate from scada and a value that's coming in from the eso and about you know 
and Pi's becoming that spot to put it all into. So yeah, it's real time data, but it's all manually entered or pulled out of old databases. And and Pi through you know the tools that it's got like Data Link and Vision is is able to be that centralized spot where people go right. I need data. I just go to Pi rather than fifteen different spots. But the other one that I really like, and this is my favorite sort of operator slash pie person at, at Power and Water Story. Um, and we had these two guys who were uh, a generation management in Power and Water. And, and look, I'll, I'll put it bluntly, they weren't exactly pie fans. You know, they sort of went, oh, it's a load of crap, we don't need this, rah, rah, rah. And one day they sort of were talking about uh, a couple of things. I sort of said, well, you know, what are, what are you guys trying to sort out? And they went, oh, look, we've got all these outages and we don't know what they're coming from and we don't know where they are and we're trying to track them in an Excel spreadsheet. It's just not working. I said, well, why don't we try it in Pi? Oh, can Pi do that? And go, yeah. Um, so what we did is we pulled all of the, the data out of the generation uh, SCADA system, threw it through a couple of analyses, did a couple of event frames, um, and basically provided them this proof of concept uh, page, which they could then go through and put all the reason codes for why the outages were occurring. And this guy just, his eyes just lit up and went, that's amazing, how do I get more of this? How many sites have we got? And I went, oh, about 30. And they went, well, we've got 52 power stations. Can I give you a bucket of money and you can put the rest on? I went, yeah, cool. So, you know, within about 20 minutes, he just went, wow, this is amazing. You know, just being able to track the outages in all of his communities was just incredible for him. Um, so, you know, having that sort of thing where people just just click one day is just, yeah, it's really good. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the funny, ironic things when you do on-site training is, of course, people are using their own data. So it's really difficult to keep the class on time because everybody wants to look at the data. Everybody's, and you start these big long conversations and arguments and flame wars and whatnot because <laughs> hey, it's, your, it's their data. It's, it really facilitates communication. Um, are there any things that you're planning on doing next? Any, any future ideas for making use of your data? Oh, heaps. <laughs> I've got a whole list of things, um, mainly uh, along the lines of what Kieran's already hinted at, um, bringing in some of those standalone databases so that uh, Pi is able to provide that comparison between some of those standalone data sets. Um, we've got several guys who do reporting every day. That's what their job is to do reporting. And it, we're, we're trying to help them in being able to produce those reports, not in a timely manner, that, that's more what management would prefer, but certainly um, to save them time. So instead of taking 40 hours to do a report, it takes them six. Um, so we're looking to consolidate some of those databases. We're looking to finally start connecting Pi to our corporate systems. So we have a corporate GIS, which is Esri, and we have a corporate um, asset management tool. And I think by the end of the year, we'll start making some inroads in how we might be able to do that, as well as our corporate reporting, which is in Tableau. So we'll be able to start testing um, how we can do that. So then we can show several data sets alongside each other in Tableau that are from Pi, which will be amazing. Okay. Great. Yeah, on, on the remote side of things and the generation side of things, you know, we've got, I think it's 370 something remote generators. You know, we've got this massive fleet or, oh, sorry, no, 160 remote generators. Um, so this huge fleet of, um, of diesel gen sets that we run out in the middle of nowhere and condition-based monitoring and automated condition-based monitoring of that is, is something that um, we're really looking into, into doing. So I've been working with um, one of the guys in Darwin to start bringing in some metrics on how all of these sets should operate and you know load curves and all of that sort of thing. So that when that sort of starts to kick off, that'll be quite a, quite a massive project to, um, to get going. So yeah, that, that's one of the big ones that's coming up um, from, from the remote side of things. Um, the other thing for data management, though, is we are still getting those faxes, as, as Kieran said. We get them in once a week. Um, and there's two people who its sole job is to take the data from those faxes and put it into Pi, uh, one for generation, the power side of the business, and one for water. Now, we've started to look at how we can improve on that process. Already they're using Pi tools. Um, they're using the uh, manual logger web to import that data. Um, but we'd like to really um, sort of try and pivot away from using the manually entered data as the sole source and try and have other alternative sources. So we have SCADA in the community. Maybe we can start using that and we start comparing that and using the 
manually enter data as a validation source instead of a primary source of information. So that's a work in progress at the moment and we're trying to improve on that. Kieran can probably smile a lot more than I can about how far we're progressing with that. Um, but that's a big one for us as well. Uh, it's not just for automated reporting or anything, it's actually to get more visibility and more resolution on the data rather than once a week, here's a, here's a read, this is how much the bore is pumped out. That kind and of thing. I as I say, and I think we both just forgot one of the major ones that's coming on in the next uh, few months, which is our power um, distribution side yes. of the business. Um, so currently the Pi system is mostly used for remote water and remote um, power gen along with urban water and, and sewer. But our power distribution network uses a completely different um, historian which is a number of years old and a bit out of support and so they're actually moving over to power uh, sorry moving over to pi um, hopefully sort of mid to late uh, part of this year so um, yeah that's a pretty major one that's coming on okay great great okay well um, I wanted to ask you a bunch of lightning round questions okay uh, so we've we've gone through all through the material we wanted to talk about and if you think of anything that we've forgotten please you know pipe up at any point but real quick lightning round e either one of you take these questions so uh, well actually Nora are you downtown or are you at a production site I'm, I'm at home oh you're at home that's right what am I thinking of okay well that's a dumb question to ask Lego nowadays, work, isn't it? but they wouldn't let me have a bookcase <laughs> so yeah well, where are you normally? Do you do you work out of a like a, are you, you know, a lot of folks a lot of folks that are working with real time data are, are at headquarters, or at a quality control lab, or you know, research and development. Yeah. And of course, a lot of folks are at a production site. So which is it for you? So I do work in an office, but it's an operational office, so we don't have carpet on the floor, which is a good thing. I'm getting used to it. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, so I work actually with a bunch of Kieran's colleagues, um, who are a bunch of SCADA engineers. And I think it's great to sit there and work with them. I get to uh, build those relationships where we've got really strong re working relationships with those guys. Um, we're able to keep abreast of all of the new uh, projects that are going on in SCADA so that uh, we're not left behind or it's six months later and all of a sudden, oh, hey, here's the pie tags for that new sewer pump station we commissioned a while ago. Okay. You know, that kind of thing. How about, yeah, yeah. How about yourself, Kieran? Um, so at the moment I'm at home too, um, but normally uh, I sit in an office in Alice Springs. Um, so it's again sort of part office, part operational centre, part storage area. Um, we've only got sort of one site in Alice Springs, so it's sort of everything for everyone. Okay, so do you have to wear steel tip shoes there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We do the. You t this is quite abnormal. Me wearing you know a sort of a, a, a proper <laughs> shirt. Normally it's high vis this and high vis that. Yeah. For, how about fireproof clothing? Yep. Yeah. So um, we're Jeez. we're moving down to the um, uh, flame retardant stuff. Yeah. A lot of you know our sites are in power stations. So how about yourself, Noor? Uh, this is pretty much my uniform, um, the okay. polo top. Uh, or we have a thing called Loud Shirt Friday, which I participate rather enthusiastically in. I'm not sure if it's a thing uh, anywhere else really. Uh, so I wear a Hawaiian shirt on Friday. There's a few other people in water services that also participate. Oh, nice. Great. Nice. Now, Chris, I'm curious, have either, either of you worked a compressed work week, you know, like 12 on, 12 off, on four, off three, on three, off four, on five, off seven, one of those weird schedules. Have you, either of you ever done that? Only when I go bush. Uh, normally it's, yeah, nine to five, Monday to Friday, but when we go bush, you know, we, we've done 12, 13 hours days for two weeks straight, oh. um, over weekends, right a whole lot, yeah. Go bush. That's a phrase I've. Oh, never... it's it's a oh, it's a I phrase. <laughs> yeah, that's... So that, that's pretty normal. Going bush is is what we do. You know, our operators they go bush on on Monday morning at about nine o'clock and they vanish off into the dust and then they come back on Friday afternoon covered in dirt and that was their week. <laughs> They've been to all of our communities. Well, I think that phrase is one of the most valuable things I've learned in this. <laughs> that's, that's a very cool phrase. Okay, so um, now that you, I'm just kind of curious, the remote workers, because you describe these workers that are just absolutely remote. What do they do about food? Do they like bring their own or do they do you go local? What do you do when you're out, when you go bush? 
Uh, it depends. So when, when we go, usually we're out there for a week or so, so we just, you know, cook a heap of extra stuff at home and take it out with us. But, you know, the people who live out there, the ESOs, they've got like a little store. Um, so it's, it's not a supermarket like you're talking about, maybe five aisles worth of stuff, you know. Um, so pretty small. But, yeah, you know, they can buy all the sort of staples, you know, fruit, veggies, okay. and that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. And I'm showing, this is Urulu. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? This is the, uh, um, this is actually a... Um, that big rock, or Rulu, did I, am I pronouncing that right? Uluru. Uluru, excuse me. So, uh, but yeah, so this, these are some of the scenes that we're talking about here when you, when you go bush. I haven't shown them all yet. Yeah. So Goodness, what in the, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that, that's um, my favorite photo from Power and Water. I absolutely love that photo because everyone says to me, oh, that's Photoshop. That's if you don't have a site right next to uh, Uluru. And I go, yeah, we actually do. Yeah, so I love that photo. It's yeah, well, it's, it's certainly striking, that's for sure, yeah. Okay, cool, well, that's good to know. That's, a, that's an interesting insight. So do either of you have a piece of broken gear or like a fried motherboard or something you keep on your desk as a memento? Um, I have old cords uh, that used to connect up to bits and pieces, but uh, one of... Kieran's workmates, Phil, has got the odd uh, burnt-out modem, I think, sitting on his desk somewhere. Okay. I have cool. I have various things. Um, <laughs> doing remote work, you always find something funny, and you go, oh, that's cool. Uh, we had a remote telemetry unit that literally went underwater, so that's sitting um, on a desk that's, you know, full of rust, and it, it completely doesn't work, so I've got that. Um, We've got a bit of old coaxial cable that got hit by lightning and just fused itself together. Yeah, we've got we've got heaps of souvenirs. Okay, so now we saw we saw the uh, we saw the crocodile in the in the pickup truck, right? And I guess that's probably the oddest wildlife. What's the most common wildlife snakes. when you go bush? Oh. What's that? Snakes. Oh, okay. Snakes are go, everywhere. I was going to go with flies. Oh, okay. But, you know, all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's volume or quantity, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'd just say the most okay. interesting are probably snakes. Um, you know, I've walked into power stations, and you know, you sort of go, "Ooh, that conduit's moving. That's not new. That's not right." <laughs> okay. Cool. And it's you know, a okay, snake sitting in our cable pit. <laughs> that's fun. That's very interesting. Now, one, and we actually had darn it. I, I don't have it handy, but we actually have a picture. Uh, that we showed earlier of a snake in, in that cable tray, right? You had a snake yeah. in a cable tray? Yeah, so that was in one of our power stations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, okay, and, and well, one last and, question. And that's, not just a, that's just not an average snake. Like, that's a king brown. So that's pretty much the deadliest snake in the world. You know, sitting in a, in oh, a power goodness. station about two meters away from me. Okay, well, i got to show everybody this. Thing. Hold on just a second. <laughs> Let me bring it up. Hold on just a second. Okay, where's our... Oh, excuse me. What Kieran isn't telling there you is we that's go. probably there we go. not an isolated incident for him either. No, no, no that's pretty normal. Um, we, we okay. had, we've had a few cases where we'll get reports from the guys in the bush saying, I'm not going to the power station. Why not? Well, there's a snake in the middle of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah so we, you can see the tail, but you, do you see, I mean, those of you watching, take a, you see the rest of the snake through the whole part? That's fascinating. The snake, okay, cool. See his head, it's about... Uh, halfway sort of uh you've got the bracket in the middle and then, then two of the metal supports to the left and then his head's just behind that oh i see yes so he's wrapped around yeah oh yeah. goodness look at that <laughs> so tune in next week folks <laughs> i don't know if we're going to top this okay so um so last question and I love this question because we're all working with real-time data at one point or another, right? What's the coolest calculation or code or whatever that either of you have written? Oh, um, mine are quite boring and because I don't do as much coding as Kieran does. <laughs> um, so I used the Pi UFL interface for a, a project that uh, one of our asset management engineers was doing. Um, it was for sewer monitoring. And so we're bringing back flow rates and weather conditions at different sites. So I always thought that was actually kind of fun because it took a bit of work to 
coach the engineer through how he could see his data and, and what we needed to do. Um, but it was actually really fun once I got into using the UFL, coding all that up. Um, Right, so so UFL, the Universal File Loader, you can interrogate any kind of a text file, right? What was the who? How were you generating the the data then? Oh well, this was um, remotely collected by the group that was managing the project, um, and okay. it was stored on their website. And we just had to download it, and then um, okay. we put that into a, a secure folder on our H drive, uh, our corporate drive, and um, we used UFL to scan that drive for any updates. That's oh, very cool. You wouldn't believe how many cool stories start with the UFL interface, you know, because there's so many bizarre things you can do with it. Well, and uh, Karen, anything you can think of? Uh, I think my favorite, and, and look, I don't want to go too much into UFL as well, but my favorite one is, again, scanning stuff from a UFL, which um, ended up with multiple columns, which I don't know if anyone knows UFL, but handling multiple columns in it is impossible. So it was this horrible <laughs> you know, sort of piece of code which went through and dynamically worked out, oh, if there's stuff in this column, then do things with it. If not, ignore it. But if there's stuff in that column, then, and it was just this sort of conglomeration of things to import. And um, it's absolutely horrific, but it works really well. Um, okay. But my favorite example from Power and Water was in the AF training. Um, so we're sitting in this training and, you know, you get to the end, it's like, make your own thing. So these guys went off and they were like, oh, look, you know, what are we going to do? And they came back and said, well, We've got some sewer ponds that are fairly close to the Darwin, um, you know, Darwin area. So in the summer, when it gets really hot, they will actually invert and basically mean yeah. the um, area around it just absolutely stinks. So what they did is they took all of this data. This is the first time they're using AF, by the way. They took all of this data from sort of flow rates and temperatures and all of this stuff, put it into this ginormous calculation and worked out when it was going to invert. And they ran this calculation back over about two or three years and went, oh, yeah, yeah, we picked up most of them. Yeah, we missed that one. But oh, I just thought it was amazing, you know, for, for working on AF for kind of a day and a half. And they've just created something, which I was like, that is just awesome. Wow, that's that's enviable. You, you, I, that's very, very cool. Yeah. Cool to hear. Well, look, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. Um, again, we've been talking to Nora Thompson and Kieran Megan from Power and Water uh, Corporation. Thank you all so much. I thank you both for, for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. Yes, thanks, Nick. Thank you. And again, I'm Nick DeRazio. Thanks again. See you next week. <laughs>